Hello, we're here today to talk about the open offer part of the ILICA fundraising, and I'm Mike Ingalls, chairman of ILICA for the last three years. In my past, I was in the semiconductor industry and best known for my period with Arm Holdings when I was on the main board there for over 12 years and ran the division many people think of as Arm, as well as being chief commercial officer uh, in the latter stage of my period there. I was excited by Ilica because the base technology was very similar in concept to that which we had in Arm, and I could see how it could be packaged up to create a licensing and royalty model much in the same way. With that, we'd like to go in and describe the details now of our open offer fundraising. I'm Graham Purdy. I'm the CEO of Ilica. Ilica is best known for its Stereax solid state batteries, uh, which were developed on our technology platform for high throughput materials innovation. Our business model is a licensing business model that is broken into three distinct phases. In the first phase, uh, and this is what defines our PL at the moment, we ask the OEMs that we work with to make a contribution towards the development costs of our technology. We then flip into a licensing phase whereby we make the IP that we have accumulated available to these OEMs in exchange for a licensing payment. They then continue to develop their products into which they integrate our solid state battery technology and they take their products to market. And in the third phase, they make royalty payments once they've achieved that. And that allows us to address a series of large distinct markets. Toyota came to us back in 2008 because they wanted to develop a solid state battery, primarily because they wanted to have a non-flammable replacement for the lithium ion batteries that they were putting into their hybrid vehicles at the time. In the course of screening a series of different electrolyte families, a, different, a series of different um, materials, we secured the IP and uh, made uh, those uh, data sets available to Toyota for them to be able to scale up the batteries for deployment. We also noticed that solid state batteries have got some unique characteristics which make them particularly attractive. They've got a high power density, which means that you can charge and discharge the batteries more rapidly than a standard lithium ion cell. And they've also got a higher energy capacity, which means that they are lighter per kilowatt hour of energy stored. We secured eight patents as part of that collaboration, as well as building on that initial IP position with their own self-funded development programs. And what we have found is that solid state batteries have got a series of USPs as set out on this slide. First of all, we've just been discussing that they're non-flammable. Secondly, uh, they have a high cycle life. So instead of the 500 to 1000 cycles that a normal lithium ion cell uh, is capable of delivering. Uh, a solid state cell can be cycled for up to 5,000 cycles. So on a daily cycle, that gives it a 10 year life. They are ultra compact, so they're about half the volume of a standard lithium ion cell. And that's because you remove the flammable liquid electrolyte and the polymer separator, as well as the packaging that goes around the cell in order to keep all of those different components together. Uh, and they've got a, a low leakage current, which effectively means that they can store energy uh, without discharging for a longer period of time. So they will typically hold their charge for up to 10 times longer than a standard lithium ion cell. And then finally, that power density is about six times higher than a standard lithium ion cell, which means that in the context of charging a normal lithium ion cell for an hour, you can charge a solid state battery in 10 minutes. This slide demonstrates the technology uh, development journey that the company has been on. On the left hand side, 
uh, our highly developed state-of-the-art high throughput screening platform which then allowed us to identify the solid state electrolyte materials uh, as part of that Toyota program which then allowed us to go into thin film stereax batteries that we make on silicon wafers and now in our most recent extension of the stereax roadmap to go into what we call our Goliath pouch cell program which are larger format cells for automotive. Our Stereax roadmap looks like this. On the left-hand side, you can see the launched products that are already available for licensing. There are Stereax M250 and our P180, which are uh, solid state miniature lithium ion cells suitable for industrial and also uh, smart home automation deployments. Then in the middle of the roadmap, we have some of the programs that we are currently partnered with. For instance, millimeter scale devices for medical implants and uh, higher capacity devices uh, that will power larger sensors. And then on the top right, our recently announced Goliath program. This slide maps those products onto the addressable markets. So uh, the M250 is really designed for smart home automation, where you combine uh, the solid state cells with an energy harvester, like a small solar chip or a PV panel, which recharges it. Um, and you use that to power a sensor that sends information over a wireless network to a central controller. So you could imagine the thermostat in your home being controlled by a deployment like this. The industrial applications are really uh, what is addressed by the P180, which is a high temperature version of the M250 and is capable of uh, operating between minus 40 and plus 150 degrees C. So this means that you can put it onto um, process lines or into other hot environments like on a compressor uh, or in the engine bay of a car, uh, and it is rated to operate in that environment. And that's a, a big differentiator relative to normal lithium ion cells that actually only go up to 60 degrees C before they start to swell because of the evaporation of that liquid electrolyte. Uh, the millimeter scale devices are really designed for uh, medical implants. You can imagine you want devices that are as small as possible in those types of environments. Uh, and these are deployments like uh, blood pressure monitors, uh, CRM devices, miniature insulin pumps, and even smart contact lenses. And then the Goliath uh, large format batteries, I think that's um, self-explanatory. They're really traction batteries, which are large enough uh, to propel a vehicle. Just to demonstrate uh, how effective this type of solid state battery can be uh, in a wireless uh, sensor network, we have made what we call some demonstrators, which are effectively a combination of the components that you need for industrial automation. So you have an energy harvester, uh, and we have uh, looked at piezoelectric harvesting, which is where you use a differential pressure in order to generate an electrical current to recharge the battery. We've looked at thermoelectric devices, uh, and probably the most common are photovoltaic deployments where we harvest light and recharge the batteries that way. And then uh, the sensors that we uh, can deploy typically measure things like temperature, uh, humidity, light intensity, and that data is then sent with a low power electronics module through to a central controller. Uh, and there are videos on our website of these devices working and of course, news announcements about the deployments of these devices. So where are we with commercialization? Um, clearly the big upside commercially for the business is to start that second phase of the business model that we were talking about earlier, where we go from development programs into licensing and we track uh, this type of uh, development in our commercial pipeline very closely. And what I've done uh, to give investors some insight into the progress that we're making is to plot this aggregated data 
um, so that you can actually map the progress that the company is making. So the way to read this chart is that we have got NDAs plotted uh, at the bottom of the columns. So that's the dark blue segments in the columns. This is where we've actually had an initial discussion with our potential licensees. Um, they're interested enough to want to learn more. Uh, they go to their company lawyers. We put in place an NDA and then we have a discussion and disclose more information. They will tell us about the products that they want to integrate our batteries into. Um, if that all works and actually we can convince them that our batteries are suitable for uh, fulfilling the needs of the products that they have in mind, we then go to what we call an MTA or a materials transfer agreement. And this covers the transfer of our batteries through to the customers so that they can test the batteries in their own labs. And we have a pilot line at our headquarters in Southampton where we can make uh, pre-commercial quantities of these cells for distribution through to potential licensees. Uh, if they go well, sometimes the customers come back to us and say, actually, what we'd like to do is build some real prototype products. Um, and this is where we make larger quantities of the cells available so that they can build a, a small sample set of these products. Um, we've got three of those uh, projects in the public domain at the moment. And then, of course, if that goes well, we will go into licensing opportunities. And I've got four proposals out there at the moment. We have deployed four business development uh, professionals around the world to close those deals. Uh, we have someone in the US, uh, Gary Johnson, who is actually uh, a, a key person for us in the company because of his network in medical devices. Uh, we have a director in China, which is an interesting emerging market for us. Uh, an awful lot of industrial uh, deployments that are possible there because of the large asset base in manufacturing. We have a director in Japan and one here in Europe. So one of the questions we're often asked is, how long does it take to go from an NDA through to a licensing proposal? Uh, and that period is about uh, one to two years, depending on the customer that we're dealing with. The other question that we're often asked is, how long does it take to convert a licensing proposal into a deal? And typically, you might expect a period of about six months to go from a heads of terms agreement through to a full commercial agreement. We generate revenue during those negotiations, often because in parallel, we're doing a development program. Uh, to demonstrate that the solid state batteries can be integrated into the OEM's product. And of course, once we have a licensing contract, that generates the licensing revenue, so the license issue fee. Uh, and that's when you get the high margin revenue added on to our P&L. In terms of the deployments that we've already talked about um, and um, that we are free to describe, We've got one in medical devices, which is about miniature medical implants. Um, and this is a two-year program which started last year. We are halfway through that. We've also got one with uh, Litricity, which is a spin-out of Sharp, uh, and originally with McLaren, uh, to deploy these devices in automotive. So uh, you can imagine McLaren being at the leading edge uh, of automotive development. Uh, this is uh, an interesting deployment there for light weighting uh, and is really a beachhead for the broader automotive market. And then thirdly, we have a deployment in wind turbines with Titan Wind Energy in China. Uh, Titan are the largest wind turbine manufacturer in that country and actually the fourth largest in the world. We do occasionally get asked about China and whether we're concerned that we will get leakage of IP um, and uncontrolled, unrecompensed deployment of our patent portfolio there. I think we have to choose our partners very carefully, and in particular, those companies that aspire to selling in the international market. Because if they want to access that international market, they have to respect our patent portfolio. This slide gives an overview of the distribution of these cells around the world. Just over half of the cells 
uh, have gone to the US. And in fact, there's a correlation between the two pie charts because on the left, you see that just over half have gone to medical device companies. And you know the reason for that correlation is that most of the world's largest medical device companies are in the US. Um, about a quarter have gone to industrial companies. Europe actually is still a big market in terms of uh, sensors being made uh, by companies such as ST Microelectronics and Bosch. They're the two world's leading MEMS sensors manufacturers. And then uh, there's 20% going to what we call foundries and IDMs or integrated device manufacturers, which are uh, part of the supply chain. This is where, of course, we would go to if a large OEM comes to us and says, right, uh, now we'd like to place a large order. Where can we get these batteries made in large volumes? So let's change gear a little bit and talk about Goliath, our large format batteries. Um, there's been quite a lot in the news. Actually, uh, hardly a week goes by without uh, one of our shareholders ringing me up and saying, wow, Graham, have you seen this announcement in the broadsheets about um, you know, Toyota or Audi or Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi getting involved in solid state batteries? And also, of course, there are lots of claims um, by research groups around the world uh, of you know, progress in this sector. I just thought I'd include some of the statements that are being made by people who have influence on the technology roadmaps in these organizations. Um, we're looking at launches, uh, probably with Toyota in the vanguard, given the fact that they've worked in the sector for the longest, uh, followed by the other uh, major OEMs in due course. So this has actually been complemented by lots of inbound phone calls to the company saying, we've seen your Stereax thin film batteries, are actually interested in larger format devices uh, for our applications. What's happened is that in the UK, uh, the government has included battery development as part of its industrial strategy, and it has put aside 246 million pounds as part of the Faraday Challenge competition. 80 million pounds of that has been allocated to the Warwick National Battery Manufacturing Facility, which is effectively a scale-up facility. Uh, and uh, a large portion of the remainder is actually being deployed in competitions uh, that are being run at regular intervals that allow companies like Ilica to apply for uh, funding to support their development programs if they are aligned with that industrial strategy. So we've just announced uh, that uh, Ilica was successful in securing uh, grant offers totaling 4.2 million pounds in the latest round of competitions. Uh, there are two programs, one of them uh, together with Honda and uh, Ricardo. So Honda has got a large UK footprint in uh, Swindon where they manufacture vehicles. And uh, they are, of course, very useful for setting the specification for the batteries. You know, how do they need to perform? And also for testing the packs once they're ready. And we're working with Ricardo because Ricardo has got the expertise around the battery management system, which is effectively the electronics uh, that you use in order to manage the performance of the cells in a safe manner. The stated aim, actually, of the Honda and uh, Ricardo program is to come up with a battery pack that can be charged in 25 minutes or less. So that overcomes uh, some of the um, slow charging anxiety that electric vehicles trigger. So instead of having to uh, charge your vehicle overnight, you can pull into a rapid charging station and you can do that in under 25 minutes. So in terms of how we get all of this to market, um, we have the pre-pilot part of the program, which is what is uh, supported by the Goliath funding, uh, by the Faraday funding. And then we move into a, uh, a pilot line phase, and we are anticipating that we would leverage and access that 80 million pound battery manufacturing facility in Warwick. And then by the time we get to large scale manufacturing, that is the licensing opportunity where we make our technology available to a manufacturing partner for deployment uh, in, in their facility. So we still have a capital light model where we are not looking to invest in manufacturing facility, 
but in fact are, are looking to license our technology and transfer it through uh, to that environment. Um, just to clarify, uh, we would expect actually that licenses would be signed during that initial phase rather than at the manufacturing phase because we're seeing interest in locking down the technology by those larger OEMs uh, prior to them committing to a product rollout. So typically this type of um, innovation is, um, is included in a roadmap uh, and secured long before it actually goes into production. So what are the timings on the Goliath program and when is revenue generated? So actually, we're starting to generate revenue from the start of the program. So in the pre-pilot phase covering the next two years, we will be generating development revenue as part of the funding that comes in that's supported by the Faraday Challenge support. Then when we get through to pilot line activities, we would expect uh, licensing revenue to come in at that point because we will be negotiating with partners to make the IP available for them to be able to nail down their roadmaps and then flip into the manufacturing model, which then generates royalty-based revenue as product is taken to market. So the phase durations, just to summarize, are two years pre-pilot activities, uh, a year of pilot line deployment, and then uh, from 2021 onwards, uh, initial market launch of the product. Hi, my name's Steve Boydell. I've been the CFO at Illica since 2009, just before we floated. Uh, and I'm here to give you an overview of our financial report for the year to 30th of April 2018, which we've just released. You can see our turnover has uh, effectively doubled from last year. Um, the majority of that is due to the three Stereax deployment projects that we've had running throughout the year. Uh, and that increased contribution has reduced our loss down from uh, 3.5 million to 2.9 million. Um, the cash balance uh, has reduced from 5.4 to 2.8, so that's about a 2.6 million uh, cash burn for the year. As our turnover increases, we expect that to reduce, but you can see even on existing levels of turnover, we've got more than a year's worth of cash on the balance sheet. I'd like to now take you through how we plan to deploy the funds uh, from the fundraising. We have uh, a CapEx requirement for some additional equipment, some screen printing equipment. It's a slightly different process. Um, and we need to invest this at the start of the program and we will get some funds, funding back from Innovate UK for use of that equipment throughout the period of the program. We also have some uh, direct project costs. So there's an overall contribution from ILICA to fund part of this program, and that amounts to 0.8 million pounds. Uh, we have an additional CapEx requirement for our ongoing existing Stereax platform, miniature batteries, uh, of about 0.2 million. And then we'd also be looking to reinforce the balance sheet with uh, 3 million of working capital to ensure we've got sufficient money there that our licensees don't hold our feet to the fire in our negotiations. So in summary, I just want to recap what the company has achieved over the last 18 months and give you some insight into what investors can expect in the coming period. So first of all, the company has secured significant IP. We have filed six patent families. Uh, we have qualified and launched the P180, which is our industrial thin film battery rated to 150 degrees C. We've announced three Stereax deployment projects. Uh, we've engaged with up to 60 potential licensees uh, and we have double turnover, which is actually pretty much the second year in a row that we have achieved this. In terms of what happens going forward, securing that offered grant funding from the Faraday Challenge, entering into licensing agreements with some of the companies that we've uh, included in our licensing pipeline, commissioning that pre-pilot line for Goliath and material increase in turnover. So the management team is very excited about all of the activities that we've got going on in the company right now. And I very much hope that you as investors will elect to be part of our story going forward. Thank you.